Today's webinar will be on Growing Big Trees in the City, presented by Andy Hillman of Davy Resource Group. Um, next week, we will have uh, our final webinar for the time being. Um, that will be on June 11th at 1 o'clock. That will be on Urban Tree Pests and Diseases, uh, being presented by Dan Gilrain of Cornell Flower Extension Suffolk County and Marjorie Daughtry, Daughtry of uh, Cornell University. Um, we ask that you uh, please save all questions for the end of the presentation. Um, please use the Q&A option to submit your questions if you can. Um, use the chat feature for any comments or um, questions unrelated to the uh, presentation. Um, ISA CE credits will be available. Um, please submit your name and number in the chat at the end of the presentation. We've been working with our uh, local liaison with ISA and getting these uh, approved and submitted. Uh, the processing time has been a little slow, but um, we will get those uh, taken care of for you. Um, we also um, are able to approve L uh, landscape architecture um, CEU credits. Um, so if you're looking for those, um, submit that information in the chat. Um, as well, and we will get you those uh, credits. We'll offer one uh, credit for that. Um, so with that, I'd like to welcome today's speaker, uh, Andrew Hillman of Data Resource Group. Andy Hillman is a senior consulting urban forester and a business developer for Data Resource Group. He has 34 years of experience in urban forestry management. Prior to joining Data Resource Group, he was the city forester for Ithaca. Prior to that, he managed the urban forestry program for the city of Oswego. Mr. Hillman served for many years on the ANSI A300 committee, which develops the national tree care performance standards. He's an International Society of Arboriculture certified arborist and municipal specialist and holds the ISA tree risk assessment qualification. He's a new, uh, he's a new Hampshire certified arborist and a New Jersey licensed tree expert. Mr. Hillman is, Hillman is an award of merit recipient, honorary life member, and past president of the Society of Municipal Arborists. He is also the founding instructor, instructor at the SMA's Municipal Forestry Institute. Mr. Hillman is a current board of directors member and past president of the, of the New York State Urban Forestry Council. He currently chairs the council's Quick Start Grant Committee. He's a member of the Town of Ulysses, New York's Sustainability and Conservation Advisory Committee, Climate Smart Community Task Force, and Board of Zoning Appeals. Following graduation from SUNY Oswego with a degree in biology, Mr. Hillman served honorably as a, a commissioned officer in the United States Naval Reserve. Andy? Thanks, Kevin. Hello, everybody. So um, thanks, Kevin, for introducing me. Thank you, Andrea, for helping set things up this morning. Uh, we'll be talking about uh, big trees in the city, one of my favorite topics. Uh, it, when I, I got the, uh, I was fortunate to be able to work with Dr. Nina Basic as chair of the City of Ithaca Shade Tree Advisory Committee for many years. And one, one of the things we worked on was figuring out how to get big trees to thrive in the heavily built urban environment. And so a few things we'll talk about today is daylighting the earth. This is also known as, you know, stripping the asphalt and concrete off um, where it's not needed any longer. Matching a cultivar to the site, not just the species, but um, also looking at, at cultivars that are suited, suited for sites and that, that will help us uh, get big trees in the city. I want to talk about big trees, but also what I refer to as big little trees. And these are uh, smaller stature trees that have a lot of leaf area and act like a big tree in many ways, but um, often are not a line clearance problem ever. And uh, we, want to, we want to mention don't lose sight. And what I mean is don't lose sights. We want to salvage and maintain a good planting site as long as we can. Trees can come and go in those sites, hopefully over a long period of time, but uh, don't lose our, our good sites. 
And we need to plan and engineer for trees. And I'm sorry if there are any engineers on today, then we need to engineer and plan for trees. So uh, here's a couple of ancient elms in Ithaca. No, I'm just kidding. Um, this is, uh, these were a couple trees that I planted as inch and a quarter whips, believe it or not. And this whole area that we're looking at uh, was all concrete at one time. And there were actually no trees at all on this block on this side of the street uh, when I started uh, this, this project. I was working with Michelle Sutton, who many of you know is the editor of Taking Root for the New York State Urban Forestry Council. And about that time she was, was working on her master's with Nina Basic and also um, interning with the city of Ithaca. So this is a, a fantastic cultivar uh, called Donata Charm or Morton Red Tip. And it's the same parentage as Omus Accolade. Accolade is a more familiar cultivar you, you might have heard of, uh, but this one is very vigorous, very disease resistant, and if you want to see a tree get big fast, we uh, this tree you sort of just put it in the ground, water it, and stand back. So 20 years ago, you know, this site was just pure concrete. There was no way you could grow a tree here. And by daylighting or removing that concrete, which was no longer needed, and that's the point. Often there is remnant asphalt and concrete in, in municipalities and cities and communities and, and even in, in small villages, we have urban conditions. And sometimes there's hardscape there that's no longer needed. It was serving a purpose at one time, but it's no longer necessary. And uh, what, what we set out to do was find those spots and get rid of it pull it out and then put in really good, rich um, soil that the trees can thrive in. So whenever you have that option, this is a great option to get big trees in a heavily built environment, is simply removing the concrete, daylighting the earth. And then if you go with like a fast growing cultivar like Donata Charm, it doesn't take long. This is the same block. Uh, this is one of Michelle's experimental trees that she was working on. I believe it's a it's a swamp white oak, but again, this whole area was uh, covered in concrete. And now you can see this tree is thriving here and it's doing what we want. It's putting shade on the asphalt. You know, that's a pretty popular parking spot right there in the afternoon because it's shaded. I wanna point out, if you look across the street, you'll notice curbside gardens. And, and that uh, has nothing to do with our talk today, but I encourage people to do curbside gardening and get rid of the, the turf if they wanted to. As long as they didn't block the intersection of the stop signs, we definitely encourage that. And there's a lot of that all over Ithaca. This is this, the other end of the block. Again, the, the, that was asphalt. Uh, we're looking at this, a Kentucky coffee tree here. And to the left of it, sort of hidden, is a, um, an Armstrong maple. And it took me a while after I took the shot to realize I was photobombed by a, a monarch butterfly. You can see right in the foreground here. But this uh, completed the planting on this block. There were no trees, all covered with asphalt until we daylighted it. And, and now that block is, uh, is shaded on that side all the way down. The coffee trees are way down at the far end. The swamp white oak is on, on the left at the beginning and those Donata Charm Elms are towering over the buildings and casting a lot of shade, which is what we were aiming for. So this tree is an English elm. I mean, I'm sorry, English oak. It's a Quercus Rober. And I believe it's a Sky Master, appropriately named Sky Master. We bought this as an inch and three quarter bare root tree it probably cost the city about $75 back then. We got it from Schichtel's Nursery. And what was important was at this site, there used to be a, a large silver maple. And, uh, and because the silver maple was there, they, when the curb was, was fixed a long time ago, the DPW bent the curb around the trunk of the old silver maple. And so you can see how it curved out. 
So when that silver maple had to be removed, we were very careful when we ground the stump out not to damage the curbing so that there was no reason to replace it. And this actually gave us, you know, about an 18 inch wider tree lawn at this spot. And so this is an example of, you know, say, um, you know, don't lose sight. If you have a spot for a tree like this and you can maintain it, that's great. I went over there last year when I took this photo and I noticed that uh, Public Works was, was paving the street again, but they had not straightened out that curb and I don't think they ever will. Um, now that there's another very large tree growing in there. So uh, when I say don't lose sight, I'm talking about if you've got spots that are good for trees, good sites, trees can come and go in those sites, and often over a long period of time, as silver maple was there for many decades, and hopefully this English, uh, English oak will be there as well for a long, long time. Uh, I've liked to plant trees that were small and small to begin with that would then get large. And this tree is a, it's a white oak and we planted it actually as a number three container. It's like about a three gallon container tree that cost the city $15. But again, the site was good. I, the people here promised to take care of that little tiny tree when we planted it there. It was only a, a few feet tall. And, um, you know, it was easy to plant with just a shovel. But I, I went by last year and I noticed that they had removed the turf and they and they'd covered it. It looks like they did some um, sheet composting or, and put down uh, wood chips on top. And I think that's great. That's going to slow down the, the runoff from the rain. It's going to help this oak tree get really big someday. It was a very small investment and we're going to end up with a, a very large, great big golding uh, white oak someday. Now, when I was talking about planning and engineering for trees, this is one of the things um, I'd like to show you. The, um, this, is, this is actually a bridge. And I, <clears throat> we had a visiting bridge engineer from Columbia for a while in, in visiting Ithaca and working with our engineering department. And he designed the replacement bridge over Cascadilla Creek in this neighborhood. And I convinced him to add a sandwich of structural soil in, on the bridge. So this tree is actually growing on a bridge in engineered soils. And I'll show you uh, what that looks like. Here are a couple of um, new, more newly planted trees on the same bridge. And if you look over here to the right, you can see um, it's actually right over Cascadilla Creek and um, all kinds of fish run up this stream from Cuba Lake. But we have bridges with trees growing on them. So there are ways to get trees to thrive in the heavily built environment and even on bridges within cities. And they can have trees that thrive. This is another example of um, engineering and planning for trees. And what what we had here a long time ago, I I planted four uh, bur oaks in structural soil installation right outside City Hall. And I went by again last year looking, and they were they had eliminated two of the trees but they'd kept the, the um, site intact back here. So there's still a, a lot of rooting volume for these bur oaks. And, and the, site, the site's been maintained even with all this construction around here. So this, this site was, was planned and engineered for uh, a very large tree. And even though it's built up all around it, you can see a parking garage in the background. Uh, this is a, a driveway and then there's parking outside City Hall. It's all all built up around it. It's all asphalt and concrete just about everywhere. But there's enough rooting volume for this tree to thrive and, and achieve its uh, potential. There's another shot of the same tree and the construction going by. And uh, this fencing is protecting pedestrians, but it's also 
providing little protection for the tree during the construction. Right across the street uh, is the public library and along the front of, front of the public library there used to be some tree pits or as we used to call them tree coffins and these were about um, uh, five by five by four feet deep so maybe you got a hundred cubic feet of soil in there and there were some Norway maples that just looked awful every summer they would be struggling and they were slowly dying there. When the water department said they had to put down a new um, pipe underneath the sidewalk, I thought, oh great, there's a good, a good uh, opportunity here. And so they, um, they agreed to backfill around the pipe and, and in the trench with structural soil that would support the hardscape. And that's what structural soil is a backup. It's, it's just an engineered soil that will support the sidewalk and the hardscape on the surface, but also allows tree roots to grow through it. In this case, it was CU structural soil, which was developed at Cornell. And matching the tree to the site, these are chinkapin oaks. Again, these trees will get very large. They're native to dry, rocky out, uh, outcrops. And uh, dry, rocky outcroppings of limestone sounds like a downtown sidewalk to me. So underneath this long strip of, of chinkapin oaks, Quercus muhlenbergii, is a continuous pit of structural soil. So the roots from this tree can actually meet up with the roots of the, the adjacent tree underneath the sidewalk here. Again, there's a lot of rooting volume and these trees are thriving. The, the foliage is nice and dark and green and glossy and the trees are, are happy there, even though the pH is very high in this site. Uh, many trees would not do well here at all. You couldn't plant a pin oak here and expect it to thrive. So matching the tree to the site is critical if you want to get big trees in the heavily built up space. The one thing I tell people often is, uh, you know, they talk about signs and when we prune trees, we're often doing it not for the purpose of the tree, but for other purposes, usually related to clearance pedestrian clearance, vehicular clearance, sign clearance, uh, uh, utility clearance, overhead utilities. Uh, and, and sometimes the, the uh, merchants would say, well, I want a small tree because I don't want a big tree that's going to block the signs. And I try to tell them, and we've had some success with, at this, that uh, it, small trees block signs, the big trees don't block signs. And if you plant the right tree and it, and it grows fast, it's thriving, it won't be long before you can remove the lower limbs. And so this is an example of a, um, again, it's a hybrid elm. It's growing in a long, continuous structural soil installation underneath the sidewalk. And, and the tree is thriving and it's been limbed up so that it's no longer, um, there's no longer a sign clearance problem here and the big tree is not blocking the sign, but it's doing all the, providing the benefits that we want to have from large trees. This structural soil installation is one of our, the largest that I was involved in. And it, it basically goes from the granite curb to the building facade and from corner to corner on both sides of the street for several blocks on State Street. <clears throat> this is the same street, again, the structural soil goes from the inner edge of the sidewalk where you see the lawn here on the, on the right, all the way out to the granite curb underneath this pressed colored fancy concrete, with some pink and some gray. And some of the trees were, were pre-existing and we actually um, worked around them. And this is, again is another example of, a, of an elm that was planted in the structural soil and it's, and it's doing well, and it has a tremendous amount of rooting volume. So I think if what we were going to do at this point, Kevin, is um, ask that first poll question about engineered soils. The poll is up. Oh, sorry. 
The first one was about the hub, removing pavement. Sorry about that. So, um, oh, I just uh, you want the other is, one up? Yeah, no, no. Let's do this one first, and then um, we can go into the next one. Okay. So this is uh, this is interesting. It sounds like uh, people have a little over half the folks on have um, have removed pavement to create planning sites, which is great, and um, and. A lot of people are would consider it, and, and very few don't think it would work in their community, and and so that's that that's a little bit more more than I expected who have actually done this. So that's really great. That's fantastic. And um, so could we uh, could we then just go right into the next poll question, please, Kevin? And that's the one about engineered soils. And this is the second and last of our polling questions this afternoon. So, and I'm talking about not just CU structural soil here, but any engineered soils, there's an Amsterdam mix that's been used around the world. And uh, we've had, we had great success with CU structural soil. And that's the one that I'm familiar with. We've, we've tried, we've used it in many different ways when I was city forester in Ithaca. So um, uh, about 20% have, uh, have done it and uh, most people would definitely consider it to, um, which is good. We need to plan and engineer for our trees in the heavily built environment. Otherwise, uh, likelihood that they're going to thrive is, is slim. Okay. Thank you very much. Can you take that off of there, Kevin? Is it off or? Oops, oops. I can't believe I did that. Okay. Get back to where I was, sorry. So um, I mentioned big little trees. And what I mean by that are trees that are dense. They have a, they have a lot of surface area. So they're providing um, some of the benefits that we want from big trees, uh, but they're small stature trees and they're not going to get up into the, uh, the power lines. Some of them may reach the bottom of communication lines, but it's not going to be a line clearance problem for the power company. And the first one is one of my favorites. It's called sugar cone. And this is a, uh, actually a sugar maple, Acer saccharum. And I've been watching the parent tree of this cultivar for um, a few decades now. It's a Schichtel's nursery. And this is a true dwarf sugar maple. A long time ago, I, I gave a talk to the uh, Utility Arborist Association, and I started out by saying that I like to plant sugar maples directly under the power, primary power lines, just to make everybody spit out their coffee and pay attention. It's <laughs> like, what? Um, but, but you have to know your cultivars, so that was the whole point. There are cultivars that can be matched to sites. But what I like about this is, is its density. It's opaque, you know, you cannot see through um, a sugar cone for the other side. So it acts like a screen, which is sometimes what we want from trees. And you can see the leaf, the branching is just so dense. This thing only grows uh, maybe you know, a quarter inch a year, but the, uh, the leaves are full size leaves, just like typical sugar maples. And, um, and it's just a very dense, with, packed with leaves, opaque kind of small tree that, that acts in some ways like a big tree. Here's another one, and I know they're kind of Susie and they're little, look like Dr. Seuss trees, and some people think they're just plain weird. I, I um, often joke and tell people that the cool thing about them is when you tap them for maple syrup, you don't have to boil it down. And of course, that's not true. So the cultivar is sugar cone, but right behind them, 
right behind the sugar cone is the tree I want to talk about next. And that's a globosum black locust. So it's Rubinia pseudoacacia globosum. And it's a globe shaped, short stature, but really dense canopy variety of black locust. And I know uh, black locust is often considered evasive, um, but when, in my experience, when you plant a black locust in a situation like this downtown, um, in a tree lawn that's being mowed, there's no place for this tree to, to invade. And, um, and globosum is also a little shy, it doesn't produce a lot of, of fruit, so it's not producing a lot of seeds often. But, but the point here is that these, uh, there's overhead power lines, primary power lines, and we can't plant a, tr a typical big tree, but we can plant big little trees. Uh, and so people walk along the sidewalk here, they've got a hedge on one side, they've got this very opaque sugar maple here on the other side, and it gives a little bit of sense of privacy. When we, when we get another look at these globe black locusts, you'll see that the trunks are actually pretty large. So you feel like you're walking by a large tree. And because the canopy is so dense, um, pedestrians aren't even aware that it's, it's topping out below the power lines. There's another shot of the canopy. So uh, I planted these trees close enough together to close the canopy. That was the aim here. Because again, because they're smaller trees, the canopy isn't as wide. Well, I planted two of them as a pair, and this provides shade for uh, a good section of the block. Here are the trunks of those black locusts. And so you can see what I meant uh, when, you, when you're walking by here, it appears that you know, there, it's a pretty stout tree that you're walking next to. And from across the street, you can see the dense shade that these trees create. So unlike a typical species of black locust, which has a, um, you know, a dappled shade, globosums have a dense, deep, dark shade, and that's what we were going for here. You can see the, uh, the utility lines, the primary power lines are well above the top of the crown of these trees. And these two trees are almost acting like one organism. As a matter of fact, they're clones, so they're genetically identical. And um, I would be surprised if the root systems are not totally grafted, and this isn't acting as one organism, basically, with two stems. So another way to get big trees in the city is to plant a big little tree in, in pairs like this, and they graft and you've actually got a one big organism producing dense shade and a lot of surface area to uh, to collect particles of air pollution and they're just doing the benefits and providing the benefits that we want from big trees even though there's overhead utilities so i threw these in uh urbanite ash trees because uh in the early 2000s, I went in with Cornell, then called Cornell Plantations, now it's the Arboretum, and we bought a whole bunch of really cool new varieties of ash tree, and I planted them all over the city, and they planted them in the Arboretum, and uh, it was uh, maybe a year or two later that emerald ash borer um, became apparent, it became apparent that emerald ash borer was not going to be contained, that it was going to wipe out all the ash trees that were not treated eventually. And these urbanite ash trees in this park were serving a really important purpose. And there was a whole row of them. And so I'm really, really happy to see that the city uh, understands, that, you know, and I'm sure this is because of Jean Grace, the city forester, and, and Dr. Nina Basic, the chair of the Shade Tree Committee, that they understand that it's cost effective to treat your ash trees. So if you have a uh, an ash tree that's in good condition and it's on a good site, it's cost effective to treat that tree. So the city is maintaining the benefits from these ash trees, even though there is a, an expense, the, uh, the benefits outweigh the expense. So 
saving your trees, maintaining large uh, mature trees, taking the extra effort to keep them is as good as planting them or better. So if we want to have large trees in a, in a built up urban environment, we need to sometimes take measures that, um, that are costly. And, uh, and usually because of iTree, we can, we can figure out um, the cost benefit ratio. <laughs> this is kind of a joke, but if you want to plant a, you know, if you want to have big trees in the city, obviously you've got to plant big trees. So this is actually a giant sequoia. And the owner of this apartment house a long time ago planted a little giant sequoia, maybe two or three feet tall in this, in this curbside garden. And I thought it was kind of a joke. And, um, but they grow fast. And uh, I, by the time I retired, this tree was getting too big and starting to block the stop sign. And I asked uh, City Forester to maybe consider moving it. Um, apparently they decided that was not feasible and it probably grown some more since then. And, and so they limbed it up so it's not blocking the stop sign. <clears throat> but there is actually a giant sequoia as a, as a street tree in Ithaca. And so if you want to plant trees that get big, if you want to have big trees, consider trees that get very large and that grow quickly. And one of those that's one of my favorites, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with it, is the Dawn Redwood, Metasequoia glyptostroboides, which is uh, actually more closely related to, um, I believe, to, to larch than, uh, than the giant sequoia. But this is a, um, a, a Dawn Redwood in a city park. And this was about a five foot tall bare root tree that you know cost $60 not too long ago. I have one in my front yard that I planted as it was a, a, a 10 inch rooted cutting that I paid $3 for. And, and I planted it maybe 20 years ago. And today it's about 35 feet tall. It's about the size of this tree. It's branched down to the ground still. But if you want to see a tree get big, fast, this is a, a great tree. It's relatively pest-free. I've seen Japanese beetles attack the leaves, but for the most part, this tree has outlived all its enemies. There's another good shot of, um, of a meta sequoia in a, in a park. And I think that I'm thinking these trees are probably going to end up being under to 140 feet tall, maybe. It's conceivable this tree could get, a, get a, well over 100 feet tall. So when I was planting trees and I wanted them to thrive, I often thought about uh, microclimate. And you can see, you know, here's a, a cartoon where the, uh, you know, you can grow tropical plants right outside the, uh, the central heating vent. And, uh, and it's not too far from reality. It's, this, is, uh, this is an old photo from 1999. And even though I look like the one who might be the tree planter, those two guys uh, to my right um, are actually really tree planters and, and they're hard to keep up with. Eric Woodward was a tree trimmer for the city. And uh, and planted a lot of trees. But the point here is that the commons in Ithaca is a microclimate. It's warm. There's a thermal pollution from the buildings, from the, uh, from the, all the uh, pavement. And in the summertime, you know, kind of almost as a joke, people would plant um, banana trees in, on the commons in these planters. Well, if you looked at, if you went back there today, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Um, so, but, but if you look around Ithaca, you will see southern magnolias. And I planted southern magnolias in, in uh, the warmer spots, what are the banana belt of Ithaca, um, down in the bottom of the bowl where it's a little bit warmer and we see it's getting warmer and warmer over time. So this was again about 20 years ago, Nina and I planted 20 Southern magnolias, and these are broadleafed evergreens with huge 
fragrant blossoms in the summer. And when these are blooming, I would get so many phone calls and people would say, what is that? What is that tree that's flowering now? But these are hardy and they've survived a lot of ice storms and snowstorms. So um, consider the, the microclimate. This is again, in, this is in a Fall Creek neighborhood, which is a little warmer down in the bottom. There's a creek nearby. Um, this building is north of the tree. So it's on a street that runs east and west and has a southern exposure. And so all that adds up to, uh, we could get away with planting a, a very hardy variety of southern magnolia. But again, it's matching the cultivar to the site. This variety is called Edith Bogue. And Edith Bogue southern magnolia is one of the most cold hardy varieties. And it also seems to stand up really well to winter snows. We've had huge snowstorms and, um, and these magnolias that are sprinkled around the city in these warm spots have come through just fine. This is some pictures I took last year when they were blooming. And I just want to uh, end before we go to, to questions with um, one of my favorite trees, big trees that um, we just don't see anymore. And th this is, of course, an American chestnut tree. This, is, this particular American chestnut is out in the Finger Lakes National Forest. I know where there are several of, of them. They sprout up from old stumps and they get, they get maybe sometimes 20, 25 feet tall. Sometimes they even start producing fruit before the fungus kills them back again. But I'm um, pretty certain that in the not too distant future, we will be planting American chestnut trees, most likely in our parks. But we will hopefully we'll see these majestic, very large, beautiful native trees again in our cities. And, and I, I think that more likely in very big open spaces like parks and lawns, but, but I, again, I hope this is in our future. So now if, uh, if we have any questions, we'd like to uh, go to questions. Thank you very much, Andy. Um, we do have some questions already. Um, this first one here says, uh, will hybrid cultivars still host caterpillars? Um, it all depends, <clears throat> but yes, <clears throat> many cat like for instance the the uh, the same pest that that uh, that will feed on black locust species will feed on closum the cultivar that that um, I showed you, and and I actually planted a lot of cultivars of black locust. We we like them despite the um, the reputation, but. We planted uh, Pyramidalis, which is a very upright variety, Globosum, the one we looked at, Twisty Baby, uh, which is a contorted dwarf, uh, Bessoniana, which is, doesn't flower much, but it's a really nice round-headed tree. Um, they're all susceptible to, lo to borers, like typical locusts, and they have the same uh, caterpillars on them. So it it all depends on um, what we're, you know, what species we're talking about and what uh, caterpillars. So if you're taking a, a cultivar of a native species, often that, that will also be a host for caterpillars, which is great because that's what we need to feed the birds. And, um, you know, but uh, there, there are other things famously, um, Cultivars of, of calorie pear really um, support very little wildlife and birds, and, and it's a, an Asian species. So, so it all depends. I think that's the answer to the question. Um, what are the long-term structural effects on infrastructure when including trees? The long-term effects? on uh, infrastructure when including trees. So that, that bridge with the sandwich of soil they're talking about, um, is there any impact on the bridge when planting trees? Ah, oh, good question. So the bridge is engineered 
um, you know, to take the weight of the trees as they get large, is, it's actually hardly um, a factor. So uh, on, in that case, uh, there's no impact other than um, the pavers might start to get a little heaved as the trees get larger and you have to pull some of those pavers away from the trunk of the trees as they grow. Uh, that, that was a real extreme case of engineering and planning for trees and um, putting trees on a bridge is uh, something that's a, sort of a luxury, I guess, if, if you have that ability and you have an engineer who's interested in trying something different. But um, in most cases, uh, you know, infrastructure, buried infrastructure and trees can coexist and for instance, um, those Quercus muhlenbergii. Now let me go back. Well, um, the won't try to get back there now. But the um, the chinkapin oaks that were in a long line, and I said that they that structural soil was put in around the water main. That's a that's a steel water line <clears throat> under pressure. The tree roots won't ever get into that tree, you know, into that infrastructure. So again, it uh, it all depends. Is often the answer to the question. If it's um, a leaky sewer lateral, um, you could have some infrastructure tree conflicts there. The roots are going to grow on a gradient towards higher moisture, and they will find a way in. If that tree, if that pipe is leaking, um, the tree will figure out how to get in there with the roots, and there's water, nutrients, and air, which is what they need. Um, but if it's a, uh, a ductile iron or a steel water main under pressure and it's buried five feet deep, then that infrastructure will never be impacted by the, the chinkapin oaks that are growing over it. And usually those installations stay in the ground for many, many years with many decades without being disturbed. But, you know, it's, it's conceivable that they would have to dig it up. And in that case, we would lose the trees. What we would try to do then is try to maintain the site. So don't lose site. If you can um, backfill afterwards again with structural soil and put another tree in there, you've been able to maintain that, you know, maintain your site. Okay. Um, there's another one. Uh, where do you obtain engineered soil or structural soil? That's a good question. There are the, uh, I understand the patent for CU structural soil has lapsed or is, you know, is, is gone, but um, usually uh, you can get it from licensed providers. So there's a Amaret chemical company bought the, the primary license and then they sub-licensed companies like gravel pits. Uh, they were, that's typical, a gravel pit that's used to working with soil and stone and, um, and they, uh, they can manufacture it and it should be tested and make sure that it's done, you know, created correctly and installed correctly. If you look at Amaret Chemical Company's website, they can, A-M-E-R-E-Q, they can uh, point out where there are suppliers near you. What I told a couple local gravel pits near Ithaca was, um, I said, look, I think we're going to be putting in a lot of this stuff in the future. And so if you get licensed, then we'll, we'll buy it from you. You can bid on it. And, and um, if you don't, then our public works department will seek licensing ourselves and we'll just manufacture it ourselves. But we'd rather get it from the private sector. Well, that motivated two local gravel pits to get licensed and produce it. And so we could get bids for the uh, delivery of structural soil to our projects in the city. There are other engineered soils and um, I, I don't know much about them. My experience is pretty limited to CU structural soil. So um, licensed providers are, are where you wanna go. And I, if, you, if you shoot me an email, um, or text me, I can probably find a licensed provider near you. Um, do you have a picture of the sugar cone with leaves off? Ooh, I don't. I'll add that though. That's a good question. <laughs> I 
it's the the I can tell you though the the growth uh, increments are very very small, and so um, the branching is dense in in there. Um, it does have good fall color, just like a, you know like you would expect from a sugar maple. And um, really tight branch or really tight, tight uh, inner nodes. But uh, the reason it looks so dense though is mainly because the leaves are full size and, and there's just a lot of um, leaf buds. So you've got full size leaves on a, on a dwarf um, trunk and branches really. Um, why do you expect that American chestnuts will be able to be planted again in our parks and lawns in the near future? And uh, oh. what can we do to ward off the virus if we want to plant oh. the chestnuts? Are we? Good question. Well, because um, there have been people working on bringing chestnuts back for a long time now in two different ways. The American Chestnut Foundation has been doing a a back breeding program where they um, they took American chestnut, crossed it with uh, I think Chinese chestnut that was resistant to the blight, and then they keep further crossing it with American chestnut, maintaining the blight resistance, but getting a tree that's more and more like an American chestnut until it's virtually an American chestnut that's resistant. And they've had pretty good success with that. I don't know what generation they're on now, but I know that that's continuing. And then the other method is the uh, genetic modification that's been going on at Environmental Science and Forestry School in Syracuse. And that, in that case, they spliced a, a fungus resistant gene into American chestnut trees. And um, there's, I saw one growing on campus there a, couple, a few years ago when York Relief met at, in Syracuse at ESF. And uh, so it won't be long before those trees, it takes a long time to bring a genetically modified organism to market, as you might expect, and it's not without controversy. But uh, I think in this case, we're not going to create a monster. I think we're going to have American chestnuts that are resistant to the blight. And this was probably the, you know, in my opinion, the, the most important tree native species in the eastern deciduous hardwood forest. So I'm optimistic. I think we'll see them. And I, I go visit them. I saw some um, American chestnuts out in the Finger Lakes National Forest last week. I was looking for native azaleas and, and pink lady slippers, but I also had to go visit the chestnuts. Can you recommend any flowering big little trees for the New York City area? Okay, so flowering big little trees um, is a, it's a good question because you know a lot of the, uh, the flowering small trees uh, don't have those characteristics I was showing you. You know, they're, they're beautiful, they have beautiful flowers, but they don't have the density that you see like with the dwarf sugar maple or with the um, lobosum black locust. So I'd, I'd have to think about that, but I will. And if you shoot me an email, I might be able to come up with something that, um, that is dense and uh, is flowering. Um, you know, one that comes to mind that, that is gorgeous right now in our area and is probably a little bit past bloom in the city and out on the island is uh, is ruby red horse chestnut. And, you know, that's, they're just so dense with leaves and blooms right now. And they we most likely will not get up into power lines. I, you know, in most conditions, I think they're going to top out around 30 feet tall. So ruby red horse chestnut, like Briati is a cultivar that I like with little darker uh, red flowers and uh, Fort McNair, which I think is a little bit pinker and the leaf color is a little lighter. But uh, I've planted both of them and the, there are a lot of them around. And so that might be a nice flowering um, big little tree. I'll try to think of more though. That's a great question. 
Um, has Ithaca experimented with bald cypress as a sturdy tree? Oh, sure. Yeah, um, so I planted a lot of bald cypresses in swales and along, if you drove Route 13, which is a state highway and it goes right through Ithaca, you'd be hard pressed to find many state highways that are as well treed going through a municipality as, as Route 13 is. But in the swales off the side of the highway, so four to six lane uh, road, uh, we put in bald cypresses and a cultivar that I really like is called Shawnee Brave. So Shawnee Brave just has really good form. But in areas that are wet in parks, uh, I planted bald cypresses. They've been planted in tree lawns and they do well. Um, we also have planted the uh, pond cypress, which is a little coarser. Um, you don't find them as often, but that's Taxodium ascendens. And uh, I've got, we've planted both pond cypress, bald cypress. In one of our parks, we just planted a whole bunch of deciduous conifers. So there's larches, dawn redwoods, pond cypresses, bald cypresses, et cetera. And, um, and the bald cypresses are putting up knees now in the wet areas. So, you know, it's not great for mowing, but um, these areas we don't want to if we could avoid mowing in them and mulch them and let the, you know, try not to fight the drainage problem, but match a tree to that site, then we'll get a big tree that's thriving. And, and they are getting very large. Um, when I go south, sometimes I'm tempted to bring back a bunch of Spanish moss some summer and, and hang it in one of the bald cypresses in the park. And uh, there's one last question I see here. Um, what are some steps a homeowner can take to minimize damage from uh, trees? To minimize damage from trees? Yeah. Tree roots? Um, I guess branches. Yeah, okay, well, uh, you know, the, the old thing about planting the right tree in the right place, right, is um, it's an old story, but, but it's, that's it. We've uh, we got to match the tree to the site. And sometimes that means matching a cultivar to the site. So, for instance, if you have, if there's not much of a setback between the, the tree lawn or the tree pit and the building next to it, then you, you know, I might consider a, an upright tree, a fastigia tree, you know, a, a cultivar like um, sky rocket um, English oak, for instance, is much more upright um, than the sky master. Um, the pyramidalis black locust, again, is another upright variety. And, and um, so for branches, you know, that, that means there's going to be less damage to a building from branches and um, less pruning required. For um, other types of damage, you know, I, people always say, is this, is this tree messy? And I would say, heck yes. <laughs> Trees are shedding organisms. We, we want them, but we have to recognize that it's, you know, it's a messy world out there. And, and um, they do take some maintenance, but trees, of course, shed leaves, flowers, buds, bark, branches, twigs. So um, they're constantly shedding, and, and that's what trees are, shedding organisms. So will that cause damage? Um, you know, probably not if we take care of them. But I don't know, um, I don't really quite uh, understand the question, but if it's, um, Preventing damage to, say, we talked about the uh, sewer laterals, buried infrastructure that can be damaged by tree roots. Well, <clears throat> you know, what comes first, the chicken or the egg? That, those, those pipes are leaking. Otherwise, the, the tree roots wouldn't be invading the pipes. So, <coughs> excuse me, the, um, the trees are actually just doing um, what, what's natural for them and the sewer lateral should not be leaking into the soil in the city. So that's an infrastructure problem, not a tree problem, really. Um, I guess that's about the best answer I can give you. <laughs> um, 
that's all the questions I see. Um, thank you very much, Andy, for contributing to this project and for giving your insight. Um, if you are looking for ISA credits, please uh, now put your name and ISA number into the chat. Um, same thing for the landscape architecture um, credits. Um, we'll leave the chat open um, for a few minutes for everyone to do that. Um, and if there's any last minute questions. If you think of a question later on, feel free to email me and I'd be happy to respond. You want me to put your uh, email in the chat here? Yeah, thanks, Kevin. And uh, I appreciate it. Andrea, thanks for your help. And thank you, Kevin, for inviting me. And it's, this has been a lot of fun. Thank you, Andy. We really appreciate it.